Hi, and welcome to another episode of Composed Living with Elsa Albert. I am your host, Elsa, and today my guest is Bree Jensen. Bree is the founder of the Social Impact Firm, an organization that partners with entrepreneurs, organizations, and communities to create meaningful projects. Bree has been a social entrepreneur specializing in youth well-being and educational support for the last 18 years. She loves working with clients to start their social enterprises, support impact projects, and working with students through the Social Impact Student Leadership Program. Bree has been a national social impact media contributor and launched her podcast, The Social Impact Podcast, in May of 2022. She was also a Rachel's Challenge presenter based on the first Columbine High School shooting victim, a family circle writer, an outreach presenter for Team Line, and a community leader in Pasadena. Bree is also a mom of four and a former competitive athlete who loves going on adventures with her family. Welcome, my guest today, Bree. Welcome, Bree, and thank you so much for being my guest today. Absolutely. So happy to hang with you for a few minutes. Yeah, and I should have known this already, uh, but you are basically my neighbor. You live within a two-hour drive, which is... Very close in Los Angeles. <laughs> yeah, that's California, Southern California language. You know, neighbor is if you can get there in a day. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Uh, well, thanks again for being here. Please just tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, how you got started with the social impact firm and all the good stuff. Oh, goodness. Loaded question about myself. Uh, well, I'm a social entrepreneur. A lot of people think that that means that I do social media and I actually am not great at social media. It just means <laughs> it means that I like to create uh, projects, businesses, nonprofits that hopefully make a difference in the world. And I am I kind of discovered that label, even though labels aren't always great, but that label a few years ago. And I said, Oh, these are my people, you know, went to a conference with other social entrepreneurs and kind of found my way there because for the past 20 years, I've just really wanted to create meaningful projects. And I've worked a lot in youth development. Um, I've worked a lot in school safety and digital well-being, and just wanting to kind of create social change in any way I see a, a challenge in the world. Um, I'm also a mom. I have four kiddos. Um, <laughs> just life kind of like took me away. And I'm just so blessed to have each of them. One in love who's 23 and married into that awesome son. And then I have three biological kids. So uh, they do, I say we do life together because they get to like travel with me on my projects. And, you know, we just kind of create hopefully meaningful change together as a family. So it's a lot of fun. That's so fun. So the 23 year old was your partner's child from a previous yeah, relationship. And exactly. Three, like, yeah. And we have yeah. like the opposite parenting. I have a 23 year old biological daughter, 24 now, sorry, she just turned 24. And then um, two that I inherited from my husband's first marriage, who oh, I, wow. yeah, they've been with us since they were one and three. They, I think they had just turned two and four, maybe. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. And they're teenagers. Yep. I'm right there. I've got two middle schoolers and then I call them my bookends because like I've, I've got the 23 year old and then a seven year old and then the two middle schoolers that yeah. are only 22 months apart. So I've got the bookends and then the oh, two in the middle. So <laughs> fun. I love that journey. All of the ages are so fun. I really love teenagers. Uh, I just think that they're hilarious, like so much personality that starts to come out. You start to see sort of like a glimpse of how they're going to be in mm -hmm. adulthood. And I'm yeah. just fascinated, you know, and it's funny. I mean, I complain about them all the time because I feel like that's, you know, my job as a parent, but <laughs> this really is like my absolute favorite. Student. Yeah. They're just so fun. And you're right. Like they get to do life with you, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is so fun to have conversations and then they have their own mindset or, you know, opinions on different things. So I love having kind of those challenging conversations and they challenge me too to think outside the box and be open-minded on different things. So yeah, it's really cool. That's awesome. I just um, have been getting into human design lately. I don't know if you're familiar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, and it's one of those things that I feel like no matter how much I research, I don't really get any additional information. Um, uh -huh. And so I finally found a really cool website that like actually explains all of the numbers to you, which was really oh, wow. seeking because I was like, I don't know yeah. what any of this additional stuff means. Yeah. Uh, but I want to do a deep dive on myself. And then I think it would be so interesting to do this for the kids and see like what already mm -hmm. resonates and maybe what might be a surprise. Uh because if that had had, like, if my mom and I had had this conversation when I was in my early teens, I think our relationship would have been quite different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's kind of like our generation of parenting's version of the love language book. Yeah. <laughs> it's totally. like a deeper dive into that, but on a, you know, social impact project level, human design is so important because for so many years in like the impact space, we've put band-aids on social issues or like we go in and think we see the needs or the solutions to things and then dive in without going into that human design and like asking the questions yeah, and seeing what the real needs are. Um, so I think as a parent, yeah, like getting to know your kids on that level. And then when you do like impact projects or really any kind of business, getting to that ground floor level of like what the actual needs are. <laughs> yeah. That's core. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, how did, so how long have you had the social impact firm and how did that get started? Was this just always your passion or something sort of triggered the creation of this? Yeah. So we're in year two of operation actually. So still in kind of that startup mode, um, which is fun, you know, being an entrepreneur, it's always in problem solving mode and pivoting and learning. Um, and so basically it, it's a compilation of two decades for me in a career of like social impact and nonprofit and working on a lot of different projects. So it's been fun to kind of tie it all in. I'm working with a lot of my clients from the first year or people that I had worked with previously in other projects or other roles. Um, and now, and now it's, you know, trickling into, um, referrals and other opportunities as well as the words getting out. But, um, but it's been a really nice way to kind of like, cause I, I think that's the other thing of being in like a social impact career. You'll, you'll hear a lot of people say that their career isn't very linear. Like you're like, how did I even get here? <laughs> mm -hmm. I did this and then it, it turned into this. So the social impact firm being a project based firm of like impact, um, it kind of has been a way to find a common thread in my career. And I'm able to use a lot of what I've done, which has worn many hats to help other, um, other organizations and other entrepreneurs to create really cool projects. So it's been fun. I think that's so awesome that you were able to take, you know, two decades worth of experience and now you're being, you know, in a position where you can give back all of that knowledge and everything you've learned. It is very difficult to create a new social enterprise from scratch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or to like give meaning, like, I don't even know how to put that into words. There's so much, uh, I was just looking at your website and I was like, I wish I had known about this organization two years ago because we just went through the filing of our nonprofit paperwork. Oh, and now, yeah, yes, amazing. <laughs> um, and thank goodness, like I love doing paperwork. <laughs> but at every step of it, I was like, this is terrible. Like there's no one resource that I could find that was like, Here's a list of everything you need to do from start to finish. Right. And Absolutely. also the future like tax filings that you're going to need to have <laughs> and what business licenses and where do you need to file exemptions? Like it's so complex. Uh, you're right. Yeah. And then I saw that you help people with their filings and I was like, oh. <laughs> next time, <laughs> the next nonprofit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I know. And you know I, it's it, all that I learned through trial and error of my own experiences. Cause I started a, new, a nonprofit in 2019 and it was like, man, I learned the hard way, you know? Yeah. So, so now I know those steps and you're absolutely right. Cause I also work with nonprofit clients in other States and every single state is different. 
So you have to navigate and often they're like, can you just send me the checklist? You know, so thank you for that little note. Cause I need to just create some checklists for people. Like I do it for my clients, yeah. but I need to kind of put out like a mass. This is what you need. Cause it really isn't out there. No. And I worked <laughs> no. with legal zoom. I went on the IRS. Uh, websites. Yeah. I went on the state of California yeah. websites. Yeah, I just yeah. like Googled things like so yeah. much research. Yeah, um, I think I even have a book somewhere now that's like how to start a nonprofit, uh -huh. and uh -huh. it still is just like check yeah. your state website to see what's required. And I'm like, cool, right. cool. I right. already did that, <laughs> and there was yeah. no and it's in another language, and I need to learn that language first. And yeah, yeah it's it's what I mean. You like nonprofit speak is like a whole nother language, so you just like and have to figure it out. Yeah, like our CPA doesn't do nonprofit taxes. He referred yep. me to two other CPAs <laughs> who also don't do nonprofit taxes. Okay. And okay. then I was back to like ground one of just now I'm just Googling CPAs at random yeah. and calling them yep. to see if they do this. And then the one person yep. I did find their prices were, so I was like, we have $0. <laughs> like, yeah. I can't that's afford the to thing, pay you. Right? Yeah. That's always the crisis of nonprofit is like having you got to find the money and then it all takes yeah. money. And yeah, I mean, but there's, that's what we do at the social impact firm with nonprofits is we just kind of like, we're that liaison to, if you need the accountant or the lawyer, you know, we have those connections mm -hmm. and then we do all the other stuff. Like we'll do all the filings and fun stuff like that. But, um, but more importantly, mm -hmm. just kind of like coaching you through, like, this is normal. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. like being a startup is hard, but it's so fun if it's, if it's for you. So <laughs> yes. And this is definitely, um, uh, my biggest passion. Uh, so we have composed living as the for-profit business. We do professional organizing, uh, as a result of organizing someone's home, we end up with so many donated items. And so from the very beginning, it was extremely important to me that those items are going back into the community, uh, that they're going freely back to people who can use them and that as little as possible is ending up in a landfill. Mm -hmm. And so when we opened our first retail store last summer, what I really was looking for was space for the nonprofit. I wanted to be able to house more donations. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were working out of a very small storage space. Then just price wise and location, it ended up being roughly the same price to get a huge warehouse as it was to get a retail space. Yeah. So now it's a combination. We have retail up front. We have an event and workshop space in the middle and in the back is where we sort and store donations Amazing. for composed giving. Yeah. That's so cool. Um, and so now we're able to have, we have a free closet for the community. Uh, we keep kid and baby items, uh, small household items, and mostly women's clothes just by nature of who we're working with. We tend to have mm -hmm. more women clients than men. Uh, and so, yeah, we have those closets stocked by donations. And now because we are a 501c3, we can accept donations from just passersby, which is so fun. But the thing yeah. is, I have not done anything to promote composed giving yet. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. I've had no time. Like I'm still running a full on business right. and we launched right. the podcast and the retail store in the same month. And yeah. I've never worked in retail. I've never even worked in retail before. And now uh -huh. I have to run and properly manage <laughs> a retail location. Yeah. Learning curve. <laughs> uh, so that's why I was, I think essentially that's how I found you and the social impact mm -hmm. firm. And then I was just intrigued by everything that you're doing. And I thought if I'm interested and I would benefit from your services, there's got to be so many more people who would feel the same way. Uh, such a long-winded way of saying. No, I love what you're doing. It, it makes me want to get in my car and come out and see it right now. Yeah. <laughs> well, you absolutely should come in to the store. And I feel like there's such a fun way that we could work together to do like a workshop or a panel mm -hmm. or some sort of like mm -hmm. an educational class um, within yeah. that space. I just love bringing people together in community uh -huh. to like talk about cool yeah stuff. <laughs> yeah absolutely but so for me and anybody else thinking about starting a nonprofit or who maybe already has one uh and this is specific to nonprofits this question mm -hmm. if I needed help with 
like currently we've not even started a fundraising campaign or even like honed in on mm -hmm. what should we fundraise for specifically or is that even yeah. important like do you just ask for money do you come up with a specific ask are these the types of things that you help nonprofits with yeah, absolutely. We actually have the most amazing development director that I work hand in hand with because I have a background in development as well. Um, and so strategizing is huge um, and just creating that kind of like three year development plan and how you're going to map that out. And so just like you're thinking of a business, like if you have any experience in a for-profit, you need seed funders, you need like friend, the, the friends and family round. Mm -hmm. That's the same in a nonprofit. So the first step is even before launch. And once you have your idea and you've proved it, um, that's like a whole nother topic that I would love to talk about, you know, like, is this a real need first? Ooh. Once you have kind of your testing and your data, then have like a backyard barbecue or, you know, any kind of like hangout to get your friends and family together, share the mission and vision, get those kind of like one-to-one -one donors, people that are going to donate monthly, even if it's the $25, because then you can look at your budget and you're like, okay, I can count on this for the first month. And then you can start with like a launch campaign and decide if it's an event or if it's, um, you know, if you have a social media following or you can get people that do have a social media following to help you like anything that costs the least amount of money that you can raise the most is kind of your strategy for the first year. Um, and then and then building it out and seeing what other people are doing. Um, is great. And then thinking like one step further so that you have that differentiator. So you're not just, mm -hmm. there's so much noise, you know, so you have to do that one thing that maybe helps it stand out. But yeah, we love, we love coming up with a strategy and implementation. We even um, will go as far as like writing grants for people and putting on the events and, you know, kind of just depending on what people need. So I think I'm falling in love. <laughs> <laughs> The way you just outlined everything, I was like, okay, step one, step two. Yeah. Got it, got yeah. It. It's like if someone yeah. just gives me a checklist that I'm like, easy, just tackle them one thing at a time. Yeah. Uh, the but when I feel like I don't have stay... that guidance, it's so hard. Yeah. We try to, at the social impact firm, I really like with my team, I'm like, let's keep it so user friendly because I don't like, I, I mean, nobody has time. <laughs> for the details, right? We just need to know like step one, step two, step three, and then you get to put your own creativity on it too. Yeah. So. Uh, my gosh. And even just in that, like one minute, I was like, we didn't even have a barbecue. I could have a barbecue we have a backyard. <laughs> we barbecue all the time, but I'm not getting money from my friends for it. Yeah. <laughs> right. A little pool party. If you have a pool. <laughs> yeah. That's so easy. It's like, come over. We have a pool party, have a barbecue. And also please yeah. give me $20 a and month. And bring your checkbooks. <laughs> yeah. $20 a month is not a big commit. I think that right. you can do that. Right. <laughs> um, that is incredible. And separately, we'll have a whole conversation because I think that this is a lot of the guidance that I need and want. And I would love to start, you know, carving out some time to devote the energy that I feel like Compose Giving deserves. I mean, yeah. even just speaking to like the need of it, one, I think that the planet needs everybody's help to stop throwing things in the garbage if there's a better place. Absolutely. To go. Yeah. So even if sustainability was the only thing that we achieve, I'm very happy with that goal. <laughs> yeah. It's a huge mission. It's incredible yeah. what you're, what you're doing. It's, it's both social focused as well as sustainably focused. So that's incredible. Yeah. And I need to pause cause I need to plug in my computer. It's about to die. Oh yeah. No worries. <laughs> I was like, how do I find a moment to, I just saw the pop up. Sorry about this. Oh, no problem at all. <laughs> We had it's, one podcast it's better episode than it, where like, fully. Oh yeah, you just vanish. <laughs> yeah. No, we had one um because I record at home in my husband's office, and most of the time the dogs just like mind their own business. But this oh, one right. day, our like little puppy was so <laughs> insistent that she like not only had to be in the room with me, but had to be like sitting on my shoulder. <laughs> no way. <laughs> It was like, sorry about this, highly unusual, but for the rest of the interview, Pip's face will just be right here. Oh my gosh, that's so funny. It probably got the most views, you know, everyone wants to see it. I know. I mean, she is the cutest. I realize that I'm biased, but like truly, I mean, she's five pounds of just love. 
and she's hilarious. Aww, and we fun. did, um, because we have the workshop space in our headquarters, uh, our brand photographer, Krista, she's branching out to do dog portraits. So yesterday she used the space <laughs> to do like, there was like no 10 way. different dogs that came in every 30 minutes and she did all their portraits. Oh my gosh. That's so funny. It was the wildest dog portrait. Like, this is portrait. extremely stressful and also hilarious. <laughs> I bet. I bet. That's so fun to see all those dogs. You reminded me when my, I have a 17 year old dachshund, like oh, he's, wow. he's the energizer bunny. I have no idea how he, like he's had such a life. But when he was a puppy, he would, when I would drive, he would climb up and like wrap his mm -hmm. long body around me like a neck rest. <laughs> so so cute. And yeah. so dangerous for the driver. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Like, oh, please don't. Have you just trying to get them to the office yesterday. I have <laughs> Pip who insists on like, she wants to be on you, like on your shoulder yeah. while you're driving. And then the other one is like a Havanese mix and he refuses to sit down. He stands the entire time and just like surfs. While no way. <laughs> Dogs are so funny. I was like, like can why both do you make these please decisions? Just chill? <laughs> right. <laughs> oh man anyway okay enough of the dogs and you're charged <laughs> yes I am charged <laughs> all set sorry uh okay so outside of the nonprofit space you help for-profit businesses or just individuals mm -hmm. maybe even to yep. create like so there's I feel like it's very multifaceted but correct mm -hmm. me if I'm wrong you can do just an initiative so if you wanted to do something that was like, now we want to focus more on giving back and like, who should mm -hmm. we align with? Or you can actually help them create an entire business around it. Right. Yeah, correct. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. It's always good when the, the message is getting out. Yeah. Especially because, you know, with the social impact industries, you also have to kind of like educate on what you do and then you share what you do. Um, but yeah, exactly what we go anywhere from um, one off projects like a give back day. Um, but still, because our core value is sustainability. So even when we work with a big company to do a give back day, we want to make sure we're matching them with an org that they can continue to work with, or that's really going to impact the community and not just be like a one day thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, we do one, one day initiatives. We can do cause campaigns for companies or organizations that reach, you know, um, various demographics and are trying to create a message. Um, and then we'll do, we'll work with, individuals on their startups. That's super fun. Um, we can do anywhere from like just the coaching one-on-one -on -one conversations, like where are you and goals to actually partnering with you to create and like produce this project. And then we also come into nonprofits and social enterprises and do operations um, and kind of make sure that you're going to be able to be a sustainable nonprofit um, or organization for lots and lots of years. So um, a lot of times nonprofits won't be operating like they'll either be too heavy on donors or too heavy on um, bringing in revenue, but it's really a balance of both because um, mm -hmm. revenue is sustainable. You don't have to rely on the donors, but then donations also create like a great boost and a great community building opportunity. So we'll come in and kind of like audit and then restructure and give recommendations and all that fun cool. stuff too. How... So a nonprofit generating revenue, that's like Goodwill having a thrift store, like that kind of Yeah, thing? exactly. Okay, yep. Yep. Yeah. And it's, Revenues we always, too. you know, like a lot of times, I mean, you, you probably, you're doing that, but like, you know, a lot of times nonprofits don't think that way. They're very, you know, focused on just the donors, but that can be so exhausting and not dependable. So, um, you know, making sure that you do have revenue streams and diversifying as well. Having like three different options um, within your mission and vision is is a great way to do it too. Wow. The wheels are turning. I love this conversation. Good. <laughs> uh, I want to ask a question about the, so also on your website, I was looking through some of the projects that you have done and you worked with the LA school district on a sustainability plan. Is that right? 
Yeah, so there was a charter um, and then there was another school district, Palos Verde School District. We did a big kind of um, audit of their sustainability plan and came up with kind of like their first step district wide um, for how to just get started. Because in a lot of these districts, you know, there's so much um that goes into it, you know, like parents will say like, we need recycling bins. Yeah, absolutely. But also the district is going to have to figure out the distribution and who picks up the recycling and who sorts the recycling because kids don't usually like, (laughs) you know, make sure that they're putting clean boxes in the recycling. You know, there's just like, that's why I talk a lot about the band-aids because you really have to do that human centered design and go through the layers and see like, okay, is this actually going to be cost effective? Because it really, especially districts or um, government initiatives, you have yeah. to look at the budget, you know, there's so much to it. So we, we just went in and kind of came up with a plan um, and submitted it to the district. So that's yeah. awesome. It's, I'm so happy anytime I hear about larger organizations, at least taking the first steps to minimize their impact. Uh, Mm -hmm. But you're absolutely right. Like think about how difficult it is for any government organization just to start something new, like the layers of funding and approvals and then also training. And, you know, it's for me, it's still a challenge even just to have a team of like 15 people to make sure that everyone is getting the same information and understanding it. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's just 15 people. And it's only coming from like one person, you know, yep. you yeah. have like thousands of people and then going down to the layers of like, who's educating the kids on proper recycling techniques. <laughs> right. Right. You just don't always think of all the layers that have to mm-hmm. come into play and then the strategy and the education and, Um, And who is this impacting and are they going to have to do more hiring or firing or, you know, like all the things. Wild. So many layers. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, And then you mentioned you have your own nonprofit that you started a couple of years ago. What's that? Yeah. So now it's the, the, we kind of morphed into social impact students initiatives. So it's an arm of the social impact firm now. And we just narrowed down to one program, the Social Impact Student Leadership Program. So we did a year of piloting last year in a middle school in Pasadena. And then now we are launching a Pasadena Unified School District actually in like a week. So we're going to be at a middle school and high school there doing um, several different cohorts. I think we're probably going to touch around... 150 kids in a month and a half. Um, and they're going to be the premise is again, just going back to that research, like first seeing what the community needs at their school. And then in the radius, like Pasadena, Altadena, um, the areas surrounding, and then they'll be able to ideate their own social impact project and, um, and then implement it. So it's a lot of fun to see what the kids come up with and, um, and get their wheels turning on all that fun stuff. So. That's so awesome. Um, Brie, who does our marketing for composed living is, her son is a high schooler at Pasadena high. Oh my gosh. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah, So we'll be at John Muir. Okay. Um, for the pilot and then one of the middle schools in the area. So fun fact, Jackie Robinson went to John Muir high school. So wow. (laughs) Yeah. Really cool. So cool. And I love that you're working with kids, you know, it's just the most logical place to start. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, it's always been, I've worked with middle school and high schoolers since I was a middle school, like I was a peer counselor in high school. And then I've just never been able to get away from them in a good way. So still, still wanting to be able to be in the classroom or be on campus or, you know, do something like that is really, uh, really fulfilling for me. Do you find that they're very receptive? Like, do they get excited about coming up with their own plans and stuff? They do as a whole. I mean, that you definitely like, I love kind of working with it. We start with working with the individual, like who are you as a leader to kind of get where they are and level set. Um, And the program is actually embedded in classes, which I insist on because when you do any kind of like club or after school program, you get the kids that either always raise their hand or have to be there. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be able to impact 
the entire group, you know, like even that kid that maybe is the middle ground that gets lost in the background. Um, so a lot of times you start with the kids saying like, I'm not a leader. I never want to be a leader, <laughs> um, kind of leave me alone. And it's fun to pull out what they're interested in. And, and at the end, they usually identify with some area of leadership and some area that they want to make a difference in their, their community. So it's really fun to pull that out of them. Yeah. That's so cool. Oh, now I'm like, what can I do with kids at the high school? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I think our middle son, he's still a sophomore, but very focused on his education and his future. And he's spending a lot of time wow. looking at colleges and what to do mm -hmm. next. And he is so funny. He was like, I feel like I need to do something like volunteering or for the community. Wow. And I was like, I mean, mm -hmm. you do know <laughs> that you can just help us with composed giving. <laughs> Yeah. They never think of what the parents are doing first. Right. <laughs> like my daughter, I took her to a conference. I was a panelist at and she's 12 and they asked her, do you want to introduce your mom? And she's like, uh, I guess. So they gave her my bio to read and she's like, yeah. I don't even know what my mom does. I'm like, well, you're literally with me right now doing what I do. You know, <laughs> so funny. So cute. And good for her for actually doing it. I know. I was so proud of her that she was bold to get up there. It's not easy. No. Um, but I was thinking about, you know, you said, what can I do when you were sharing a little bit about your model? Um, it reminded me of when I used to work with Rachel's challenge, which is a school assembly program that was founded by the family of the first victim of the Columbine High School shooting, Rachel Scott. And after she passed away, it came out that she had made a difference in like hundreds of people's lives. Like she was so kind and giving. And one of the initiatives that a lot of the schools do after we do the training is this thing called Rachel's Closet. And they set up one of the rooms that isn't being used at the school and bring on donation items and like non-perishables and things like that so that the kids that need it can anonymously, you know, like schedule a time and come in and mm -hmm. shop it. So that's kind of cool. I love that. And I did what not you know do. about that initiative. That's essentially what I told Lincoln uh, that I could use his help with doing at his high school. Yeah. Because we're always looking for, and clothing seems to be the number one thing that we receive. And so we already have various charity partners um, where we can take things and we send clothes to like the Pierce College campus. They have something similar for their students there, but I don't think that they have anything like that at um, the high school that our kids are going to El Camino. So I told them yeah. to talk to the counselors and see if that was something that they oh, good. could either set up on their campus or have us as a referral, um, mm -hmm. because we are so close where they could send people to come shop our free closets anytime. Amazing. But I love that that's already an initiative. Um, I'm going to look into that and see if maybe that's even something yeah. we could like partner with in some way. Yeah. I think each, like after the, um, one of the trainings that Rachel's challenge does is a leadership training at the end of their assemblies. And so they, they kind of task the kids with like creating a project. So that's one of them that yeah. a lot of the schools have taken on. So I love that so much. Yeah. Um, I don't think that I do a lot of work with kids in the foster care community. And mm -hmm. I don't think that's something that we think about that often, that a lot right. of the kids who are in these public schools are living in foster homes or group homes. Right. Um, they're not called group homes anymore, but you get the idea. Mm -hmm. And they don't have access to shopping for clothes, shoes, you know, right. accessories, any of the things that most teenagers just take for granted. And so even if you feel like you're living in a more affluent community, it's still so important to recognize that there are people who are struggling to make ends meet right. and mm -hmm. having these resources available can be a game changer for them. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that we <laughs> most often ask our podcast guests sometimes I forget until after we've stopped recording um, <laughs> yeah is that for you personally if there's a word or a phrase that you feel like really describes what it is that you're focused on at this moment in your life uh, mm -hmm. it can be personal professional uh, my word for this year very much is simplify um, we did so much generating new things, new businesses, new ideas. 
last year um, that I went into this year feeling like I want to do less, but do it really, mm-hmm. really well. Yeah. Um, and so I am like, I say no to everything. <laughs> like that sounds like a new <laughs> idea. I love it. Let's talk about yeah. it in 2025 yeah. right now. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Boundaries. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but what, if there was one word or phrase that kind of described what your sort of core value is right now, what would that be? Yeah. So for me, it's building. That's my yeah. word. And it kind of, it goes throughout my personal life and my professional life and my kids, you know, this is definitely a building. I don't even want to say year. Cause I definitely do like, I do words that are for the year, but I would say this is a building season. Um, my, uh, I, I went through kind of a wild decade personally, Um, my mom had passed away when I was 23 suddenly. And so after that, we had to take care of my dad was quite a bit older than her. And so, um, within that year I got married, became a stepmom, and then had to also kind of be responsible for the well being, both like financially and, and mentally for my father. And that lasted, you know, about 15 years and had lots of twists and turns. Um, and meanwhile, like having kids and, you know, trying to keep up with my career and yeah. um, doing all those things. And about four years ago, so he, my dad had passed away. Um, so in the last four years or so, you know, COVID happened, grieving my father, um, started the business, like all that stuff. I am finally feeling like this is the year that I've, I've kind of like closed a book, not even a chapter, but a full Mm -hmm. book. (laughs) And now I'm ready to like write the new pages and build, um, from kind of now on and obviously taking a lot of the, the good with me as well in memories, but building that's my, that's my word. Wow. I love that. And I love that you describe it as a season because that truly is how life goes. Uh, we have seasons that some of them last longer than others, but yes. Yeah. I feel like what season would I, maybe summer is summer, the season of just like sustaining. (laughs) Yeah. Yes. Summer is a good season. They're all about like moving towards (laughs) the next thing. I need the one that's like the in between Uh those long summer days. Yeah. Just Just enjoying yourself. Yes. That is a good one. And it's not even, um, I guess relaxing isn't even the right word. I feel like I'm busier than ever. It's just in fine tuning. It's not in, in creation of something new, which actually feels really nice. I love task oriented behavior. So like when Mm -hmm. you were talking about like the checklist, I was like, yes, I love it. I know. (laughs) I know. I feel so good to just kind of see it in front of you and work through it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And when you have a new project it's you know there's so much energy that goes into the creation of just the idea and how to bring that to life Mm -hmm. and I think my soul was just really craving the getting it done part like Mm -hmm. no more new ideas no more living in like the more ethereal idea world I want to like sit down and just be like today I'm (laughs) posting like this is what I did yesterday I posted like 11 new events and workshops onto our website and Eventbrite and social media Uh (laughs) uh Uh (laughs) and by the end of the day I was like my eyes are swirling and I don't want to be on a computer anymore but also it's so satisfying to be like now it's done and I never have to do it again (laughs) yeah exactly yeah I think that's so crucial as a founder and that's what I was I the call I just got off I was talking to one of our founders about that because again, just building, building sustainably Mm -hmm. is also about you as the founder and being able to not burn out. And you can accomplish so much more when you're not multitasking and feeling frantic and feeling stressed, you know, and I used to kind of live in that swirling energy and it just, it's, it doesn't serve anyone and it doesn't Mm -hmm. serve your business or your venture. And one of my mottos lately has been, you know, just build your best today and the rest will come your way. And just, you know, cause I was always like, so forward thinking, and it is important to have your vision and where are you going? Like all of that. But once that's set, 
and you know how you're building to get there, then just do, do your best every single day and then leave it there, you know, cause every day is going to be a challenge. You're going to have mm-hmm. twists and turns, but it's not worth, I think that's one thing in losing my parents is I, I, it's not worth my emotional energy to feel, you know, give, give things enough of me. Um, I don't want to lose like my day. I don't want to lose my joy or my time with my kids because of, I am spiraling, you know? Yeah, so. absolutely. I don't feel like, um, it's tricky. We identify a lot with what we do for work mm-hmm. uh, and productivity and achievement, all yeah. of those things. I think we're pretty conditioned to think that that's like the focus of your life or even how you describe mm-hmm. yourself as a person. Uh, but there's so much more that happens outside and completely separate from work. Like you said, I mean, you're a mom of four kids, you have Mm -hmm. a partner, you have a household, you have your other like (laughs) goals and hopes and dreams for you as a human. Uh, So I love that you have that very clear boundary and you're just building your best. Yeah. And you know, like what I would say to founders, at least this is what I tell myself is like, you just never know what tomorrow will bring. So like, if you just lost that big opportunity or, you know, that donor didn't come through, like sometimes in that moment, it can feel so devastating and it, and it, and you're valid, like it is super de- devastating, but also remember that that good thing happened like three days ago and you didn't know it was coming. <laughs> so there might be a good thing right around the corner too. And, and that always helps me kind of like get back up again and keep, keep moving forward. That's really good advice. Uh, Anybody who has started their own business knows that it can be extremely challenging. And yet I have never met anyone who has started their own business who has said, I wish I never did this and I'd rather Mm. go back and work for someone else. Right, right. So something about entrepreneurship just fills your soul, I think in a very different way. You know, I've definitely had days where I'm like, I would shut all this down. And then I'm like, but would I really? (laughs) No, because what's the alternative? Like that sounds terrible. Yeah. And then what? Oh no, no, no. Never mind. What was I talking about? Like just just (laughs) kidding. Universe. (laughs) (laughs) I know, right? (laughs) Yeah. But then you know, it's that's the beauty of it is you find uh, I went very much through like my wintering season maybe two years ago and probably lasted for two years where I was completely lacking in passion. Uh, Mm -hmm. and just didn't feel like I could do what I've been doing anymore. I didn't want to. Uh, And for me, I guess it took a lot of soul searching to be like, what is it then that makes you Mm -hmm. sustainably happy? You know, Mm -hmm. if it's not running a business, if it's not this, if it's not that, like, what is it going to take or what do you need it in this moment? Mm -hmm. And I realized at the end of a lot of soul searching that I need to feel like I'm learning something new. Hmm. And if you're Hmm. just doing the same thing, like the monotony of running a business Mm -hmm. can be tiresome after five years, six years, seven years. Now we're in our eighth year. And Mm -hmm. it was like, I have to do something other than like balance QuickBooks. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, This is not what I was put on this planet to do. (laughs) And I realized like how much I love working. I really do uh, Mm -hmm. just for the sake of working because I feel like I'm contributing and I feel like my skill set is being used in a way that can help people in my community. And I don't want to just be like sitting behind a computer and not doing anything. I definitely don't want to just be sitting in my house, not doing Mm -hmm. something that I think is worthwhile. Uh, unless I lived on a farm, that's a whole other, right. Where I we have that in common. <laughs> feeding that's <goat>. my dream. <laughs> my horse ranch. It's coming someday. <laughs> yeah. Um, and even there, I think I would still have to find a way to connect with yes. community yeah. in a way that feels meaningful. You know, like I can't mm-hmm. imagine. I mean, I can imagine being retired from having to earn dollars. I can't imagine being retired in the capacity of like, you have nothing to do. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. When I ask Those my husband, your, like, what? Yeah. You know, he's like, I just want to be retired so I can golf. And I'm <laughs> like, but isn't there like more? But now I realize like, like golf, for golf him. at a fundraiser yeah. or <laughs> just golf, like golf every day. 
But I realize like the way that he thinks about golf is extremely mm-hmm. different than how I do. Like that for him is constantly learning, constantly challenging yourself to be mm-hmm. better. It's in mm-hmm. community because you're golfing with three strangers. Um, you're outside in nature, you're walking, you're getting exercise. Like it fulfills so much of, for me, what living on a farm would do, where I would mm-hmm. still be learning about like planting, gardening, growing, harvesting right, animals. Right. Mm-hmm. I would be outside in nature. I no doubt would invite people to come be on the farm with me in my yeah. commune. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And so it just translates very, de- like he has no interest in raising animals and harvesting right, vegetables, right, but right. If we had like <laughs> A putting green. A putting um, green. There. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say. I mean, it is so true to like to understand. Again, it goes back to human design, but what gives people life, you know, mm-hmm. and that's that's what every founder has to do. When you're starting, it's all hands on deck, right? But when you get to a place that you can start reorging and seeing where you're best utilized, like that's what we do a lot for different founders when they're feeling like frantic is, okay, how can you bring on a team and how can you at least delegate parts that maybe don't bring you joy or um, or you feel like you're actually draining the business because it's not your strength, you know? So that's fun too. Like you can start with just this brain dump of like, what do I love about what do I do? What I do. And that doesn't mean that you still don't have to do some things you don't love to do. I mean, let's yeah. be honest, but yeah, so that's fun to do that. And I think here's a little tip for nonprofits, especially, and for social inter. Well, by the way, the definition of social enterprise is any business or nonprofit that's making an impact on the world. So it can be for-profit or nonprofit. So for any social enterprise, a lot of times you're like, yeah, right. There's no way I can bring on a team. There's a lot of ways to get creative. That's what we love to do. You can do interns. That's a great way. There's always um, different interns that are out there that are looking for credit or they they're interested, especially if you're doing social impact, they want to they want to learn about it. Um, so interns is great. Contractors are great because um, you don't have to do any kind of benefits. It can be, hey, I'm only I can only do five hours, but at least that takes off the QuickBooks mm-hmm. <laughs> reconciliation or whatever it is. Um, and then you can just get creative. You could even do trading, you know, if you have a service or something that people would want. Um, so happy to to help get creative in that way because team is very important. Yeah. For sure. I love having the team that I work with. Um, it's a game changer, you know, right. I would not want to, well, I did do this business by myself for the first two years and it was so boring. And it's not that I can't do <laughs> yeah. all of it. And it yeah. wasn't even yeah. overwhelming for me to do all of it. And yeah. obviously we got to a place where we were just booking too many client projects. I wouldn't physically be, there's no time for me to do yeah. everything myself. Uh, but ultimately it was just boring. I went from working in corporate where you have like so many people that you're meeting and there's happy hours and like volunteering so much community to being like, this sucks. (laughs) What did you think plant? (laughs) (laughs) Like a client who just like, isn't talking or they're not even in the same Uh room and there's no music. And you're like, is this really what I envisioned? (laughs) And then I met, um, Maddie Bryan, who she's been with us for more than five years now. Um, and I was like, this is way more fun. <laughs> we can like yeah, bounce yeah. ideas off each other. And then I was yeah. like, who else can we bring in? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so definitely fun. a lot more fun today. Uh, well, thank you, Bree, so much. I feel like I learned so much about what you all do. And now I am so inspired to get that checklist going of how we can get composed giving up and properly running and, and have that fundraising barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or whatever it is. Beach party. Who knows? All well, I'm really looking forward to watching your journey with your, your ventures and all that you all are doing will be super fans from here on the other side of the hill. <laughs> oh, awesome. Thank you. That's so sweet. Uh, and you'll have to come into the store at some point. I would love to meet you in person and show you around. And um, of course, if you ever need donations or any of your clients ever need support in that way, please consider us a resource. We always have so much stuff that we need homes for. Absolutely. Thank you.
Yeah. And then if people want to learn more about the social impact firm or want to work with you, just have questions, what's the best place for them to find you? Yeah, absolutely. So the social impact.co dot com dot co. Uh, you can also email me directly if you'd like Bree B R E E at the social impact.co. Awesome. Well, thank you again so much. It's been such a pleasure chatting with you. Thank you.